I am so glad to see you today. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Moral of the Story. And it is my prayer that week after week, you are drawing away little nuggets of application. Uh, because that's what we all need. We all need to be able to apply God's word to our lives. And so taking these little nuggets of application uh, will forever change you. Uh, just as a reminder, we are one church with three locations. Uh, I want to welcome Parker and McCulloch and those of you who are going to be watching us online. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited about what God is doing on your campus. We're excited about all that God is doing in your life as well. We have a great tech team that makes this happen. Week after week, our tech team, uh, they, they get involved in taking the video from Saturday to Sunday. Uh, they're involved in taking microphones from one campus to the next. Uh, they're involved with our lyrics. They are involved so much. We are so dependent upon them. I want to encourage you, if you are uh, at McCulloch or if you're at Parker or even here at Sweetwater and you're interested in joining the tech team, Go see them, see your campus pastor, ask how you can get involved. They would love to have you involved. Today we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 25, uh, 1 through 13, and that's page 987 in the Bible underneath the seat in front of you. So if you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you, take that Bible that's underneath the seat in front of you, use it. Now, Parker, if you're on our Parker campus, you can go back to the back of the room and grab a Bible there. It's in the center aisle in the back and, and grab that Bible and use it. Read it, apply it, because again, God's word will change our lives if... We apply it to our life. Now, do you remember the childhood game of hide-and-go-seek? I am sure that my guess, every one of us has played the game hide-and-go-seek, either as a kid, as a parent, as a grandparent. So let's find out. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever played the game hide-and-go-seek. All right, raise your hand if your parents always left you hiding while they watched TV. Raise your hand if you ever left your kids hiding while you watch TV. You know, you just keep, keep on counting, you know, 120, okay, keep hiding. Well, uh, you know that with the game Hide and Go Seek, somebody was chosen to be it, and then they closed their eyes and they counted. And when they finished counting, they would say, ready or not, there you go, you got it. And, and it did not matter if you were ready or not, did it? If you were in the middle of hiding and they said, ready or not, here I come, then they came after you. It didn't matter if you were standing in the middle of the room unless you were able to shout, not ready. And then they might start over or they might not. If they wanted to show mercy, they would. If they liked you, they would. If they didn't like you, well, they would just come on and find you. When the girls were younger... When the girls were younger, they would play, we would play hide-and-go-seek, and mom would bring all the girls together, and they would all hide in one spot, and I was typically it. And I would go after them and find them, but it was very, very simple. My youngest, Jessica, always made it simple for me. All I had to do if I got stumped and couldn't find them, which wasn't often, uh, but if I got stumped and couldn't find them, all I had to do is begin singing one of Jessica's favorite songs, Trail Off. And then she would start singing it. <laughs> so it would look like I'm standing in the room and maybe it's dark. And I just say, ba, ba, black sheep, have you any wool? And then I hear this little voice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three mags full. She couldn't, she couldn't not announce where she was. Um, and it was fun. Like we spoke about last week. Jesus almost always compares the kingdom of heaven to a joyful occasion. And the parable that we're looking at tonight is no exception, or today is no exception. The, the kingdom of God, again, is compared to a wedding feast where there is much joy, where there is much celebration. But just like last week, there are people who are going to miss out on the celebration. Let's read together page 987. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is a bridegroom, come out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, this parable can be a little bit confusing if we focus on uh, the virgins, if we focus on the lamps, if we focus on the wicks, if we focus on the oil. It could get a little bit confusing. So I'm going to try to really simplify it, not for you, but for me. So I can understand it a little bit more. Raise your hand if you had bridesmaids at your wedding. Raise your hands if you were a bridesmaid. Men, none of your hands should be up. (laughs) So that is what the virgins were in this parable. So the virgins were like the bridesmaids. Now raise your hand if you ever brought a gift to a wedding. Okay, so consider the lamps as wedding gifts, and most of us don't bring an unwrapped gift to a wedding. We wrap it and think about that wrapping paper as the oil. After a man and a woman became engaged in this day, the groom would, uh, they would not set a date, and the groom would uh, get his house ready. He would go and make sure that everything was set, his occupation was set, he had enough money, he had enough finances, he had enough whatever. And when he was ready, after the the, uh, bride already said yes, when he was ready, unannounced, he would come back to town and say, here I am, come marry me. And so these women had already agreed, these bridesmaids had already agreed that they would be a part of this celebration. They agreed that they would be a part of this incredible special day that they were going to celebrate together. Five of these bridesmaids brought gifts, right? And they had them wrapped. And the other five brought gifts, but those gifts weren't wrapped. They didn't have that wrapping paper. And so the groom shows up. They said, hey, the five bridesmaids said, hey, let us borrow your wrapping paper. And they said, we don't have enough for you. We only have enough for us. Therefore, uh, go buy your own paper. So that kind of brings us to the moral of the story. And it can be summed up in verse 13. But the moral of the story is ready or not, here he comes. Whether we are ready or not, Jesus is going to return to this earth. There are some people who are going to be ready for the return of Jesus. And there will be some people who are not ready for the return of Jesus. But it doesn't matter because like this groom came rolling into town, people are going to hear this cry. Jesus is going to return. And we have to make sure that we are individually ready to participate in this celebration. And, you know, we can try to run from God. We can try to hide from God. We can argue against the existence of God, or we can be a follower of Jesus. The fact is, one day, Jesus is going to return. It will be unannounced. We will all not be expecting it, but Jesus will return. Forty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he gathered his disciples around them and told them to go tell people about him everywhere they went. And as soon as Jesus said that, can you imagine, his feet began to lift off of the ground. A cloud surrounded him. He went up into the sky, going up higher, going up higher, going up higher. And the disciples stood there straining and looking and trying to see Jesus disappear into heaven. And they stood there so long that an angel or two angels showed up and said, hey, why are you guys still staring up into the sky? Don't you know, just as you saw him leave, he will one day return. 
That is what it took to snap the disciples out of their trance. Oh, Jesus is going to come back. He is going to return. He said he was going to die and be buried and raised from the dead, and he did that. He is going to return. So they stopped their gazing, and they started doing what Jesus called them to do. Now, the return of Jesus was a very common teaching in the New Testament church, in the early church. Uh, The apostle Paul wrote about it. Peter wrote about it. James wrote about it. Peter said in 2 Peter 3.10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. How many of us expect a thief to show up? We don't expect a thief to show up. If we do expect a thief to show up, we're going to show up with our gun, right? Or we're going to show up with the alarm system or security. Thieves arrive unexpectedly, and so will Jesus. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout. And the brother of James, or the brother of Jesus, James, reminds followers of Jesus to be patient as they wait for the Lord's return. In James 5 7, James says, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. See, the early followers of Jesus lived and breathed expecting Jesus to return any moment. They went around telling people about Jesus with an eye to the sky. They loved other people as they loved themselves with an eye to the sky. As they told people about Jesus, as they gave generously, as they did life together, worshiping God together, they kept looking and they kept waiting for Jesus to return. They knew he was going to come back. Do we live with that same type of expectation? Do we live with that same type of thought that, that, that takes over almost all of our life that in this moment, Jesus could return? You know what we call people today when they talk about the return of Jesus? We call them crazy, don't we? We hear for the, last, uh, for the last several decades, people are always providing a date when they begin to talk about the return of Jesus, right? They, they say, hey, Jesus is going to come back on April this date or April that date or March or whatever it is. And then they develop this New Testament, Old Testament formula to prove to people that this date is absolutely right. Or they look at the signs in the heaven and the stars and the skies and they say on this day, because this is happening in Israel and this is happening with the planets, then, and this is happening with the stars, Jesus is going to come back on this specific date. Since the 1900s, Did you know that there have been 20 dates predicted that Jesus will return? 20 dates. I, in fact, personally knew a deacon that stood up at the close of a service and said, I have sold my business, I have sold my house, I have given everything away, and I think you guys need to as well because on this date, Jesus is going to return. He was homeless. Jesus obviously did not return on that date. When people begin to talk about the return of Jesus, followers of Jesus typically tune them out because we understand that not even Jesus, not even the Son of God knew when he was going to return. Jesus said in Matthew 24, even though he taught about his return, he said in Matthew 24, heaven and earth, will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. So don't let kooky people convince you of a date that Jesus is going to return. Don't sell all your possessions and goods and give to their ministry believing that they are correct. Jesus says himself, he doesn't even know the date or the hour. Only the Father in heaven knows. So what does that mean for us? 
Well, I certainly don't want to discourage you from living like Jesus could return any moment. In fact, that's how we ought to live. We ought to live as though Jesus is going to come back tomorrow. In fact, how would you live differently if you believe that tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., Jesus was going to return? And he was going to gather together all the people who believed in him and take them off to heaven, to the wedding feast in the sky. Would you offer forgiveness to those that you've not yet forgiven? Would you offer love and concern to those that you've not yet shown love and concern? Would you tell your family about Jesus that you've not yet shared the gospel with? Would, that you've not yet shared that life-changing power of the gospel with yet? See, I think that if we really bought into this idea and we were really convinced that Jesus could return any moment, I really believe as followers of Jesus that we would be telling Lake Havasu all about Jesus. We'd be telling Parker all about Jesus. That we'd be telling our friends and our family all about Jesus because we know he is going to return and they won't have a second chance. Now, Jesus did not warn about his return because he wants to strike fear into our hearts. If you're feeling the sense of dread that Jesus is going to come back any moment, that's not why Jesus warns us. That's not why Jesus taught us. He's not like a parent threatening punishment, don't make me come down there, or you better listen to me or else, or wait till your father gets home. He's not telling us about his return to scare us or to frighten us. In fact, Jesus warns because he loves. He warns because he loves. Consider 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think, talking about the promise to return. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. You see, the simple reason why Jesus has not yet returned is because he loves. He wants everyone to turn away from the world and begin to follow him. He wants everyone to experience the life-changing transformation of the gospel. He wants everyone to experience forgiveness of sins. He wants everyone to experience new life. He wants everyone to experience peace and joy and hope in this world so that they can live it and love it for all eternity in the next. See, the reason Jesus hasn't come back yet is because there are still people in Lake Havasu that have not yet trusted Jesus as their Savior. Is that you? Is that a family member? Is that a friend? Again, take a look at 2 Peter 3, 9. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. See, God's not dragging his feet or putting off the return of Jesus. Rather, he's patiently waiting because he loves. Romans 5, 8, I want to encourage you to memorize that verse if you haven't yet memorized it. Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. John 3.16 is a very familiar verse with most people that, that follow Jesus. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John 4.10, John wrote, This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. See, Jesus gives this warning about his return, not because he's trying to frighten us, not because he's, he's trying to scare us into becoming followers of Jesus. He tells us because he loves us. You are loved by your creator. And I know that some people struggle with that. 
Some people think about God's love as though uh, maybe it was an abusive father or an abusive mother that they had as they grew up. And when they think about God's love, they think about it in that tainted way that they experience. They think that maybe God is just this abuse of God in heaven and doesn't really care for them. God loves you. And if you struggle with that view of God because you had that abusive parent, can I tell you, I've been there. I know that. I had an abusive father. I understand. When, when I first came to, to, to God, when I first gave my life to Jesus, I, I, I wondered if God was just out to punish me. I wondered if God was just out to doom me. And I can tell you that what I've learned from the Bible is completely opposite. That God loves me unconditionally. And he loves you. And your heavenly father or your heavenly mother or your heavenly parent may not have demonstrated the love of God to you, but Jesus did. And God did through his son. God demonstrated his love for you while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. If you've ever warned your kid not to run into the street because of an oncoming car, you've done the same thing. Right? Don't run off. You hold their hand in the parking lot. Why? Because you love them. You don't want them to get run over. You want to hang on to them. You, don't, you want them to learn. Right? You want them to stay close to you because you love them. Now, there were five bridesmaids. They were trying to borrow oil from those other bridesmaids. bridesmaids. They were thinking that, hey, uh, let me have a little bit of yours and it will be sufficient. And I believe that at the return of Jesus, there will be some people who are depending upon the faith of their parents. There are going to be some people who are depending upon the faith of their grandparents, their spouse, their children, or a good friend that they that themselves, knowing this other person who knows God, is going to be enough for them to enter into heaven. But the Bible teaches us that I am unable to borrow forgiveness of sins from anybody. Uh, I have met and counseled with so many people who are depending on another's personal relationship with God to get into heaven. Some people think that because their spouse attends church or their spouse prays or their spouse ties part of their income or their spouse has a growing personal relationship with Jesus that when they die, it's going to be enough for them to get into heaven. That Jesus is going to say, okay, I knew your spouse, come on in. Or, or your spouse was a blessing to me. She really served a lot of, uh, on a lot of mission trips. And yet that's not the way it's going to be. Those five foolish bridesmaids were shut out of the wedding feast completely. It didn't matter that they had been with the other five bridesmaids. It didn't matter that they had been invited. The fact is they were unprepared. The Bible is clear. Our spouses cannot get us into heaven. Our children cannot get us into heaven. Your child may be a pastor or a priest or a nun or a, a, a missionary. You might even be related to the late Billy Graham. It does not matter who you know on this earth. It only matters if you have prepared for the return of Jesus by trusting Christ as your Savior and Lord. Romans 14, 12, the Apostle Paul said, each of us will give a personal account to God. Each of us, meaning you and me, are going to give a personal account to God. Galatians 6, 5, Paul said, we are each responsible for our own conduct. And so I have to ask myself this question, same question I want to ask you. Are you ready? Am I ready? Because one day it will be too late. Now, see, I, I personally accepted Jesus as my Savior in late July of 1991. I understood that up until that moment, I had ignored God and I had chosen my own way to live. And in that moment, 
I believe that Jesus voluntarily gave up his rights as God's son. He paid the penalty on the cross for my sin. And in that moment, I thanked God for forgiving me of my sin. And I invited Jesus' invitation to be my Lord and Savior. And on that day in July of 91, I prepared for all eternity. I, I, I prepared it all. I gave my life to Jesus and I asked him to forgive me and I invited him to be my Savior and I became a follower of Jesus. Have you? Have you became a follower of Jesus? Have you accepted this invitation to be forgiven for your sins? Or are you counting on other people to get you there? See, the only one that we can count on is Jesus because he's the only one who died on the cross for our sins. He took our punishment on himself. So it doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter if you've served on a mission trip. It doesn't matter if your spouse does all that. What matters is if you have personally accepted Jesus. And some people wait to clean up their life. They don't understand that Jesus is the one that's going to clean up their life. They, don't, they think, that I've got too much living left to do, or, or if I went to church, the, the church would fall in, or if I gave my life to Jesus, the whole church would catch on fire. People feel like sometimes they're supposed to clean up themselves in order to come to Jesus, but that's not how it works. We ask Jesus to forgive us, and he begins that cleaning process. He cleans us, and then he begins to help us become a follower of Jesus for the rest of our lives. I want to encourage you to stop waiting. If you've been waiting, if you've been depending on somebody else, stop dragging your feet. Uh, you know that the Lord is kind. You know that the Lord loves you. I want to encourage you to give him your life today. At the close of our service, members of our prayer team is going to be down front here at the bottom of the stage, at the bottom of the platform, and they're going to be ready for you to come forward and say, I want Jesus. If you're at Parker, you can walk down to the front, walk down to the platform. Members of the prayer team are going to be there and allow you to give your life to Jesus and pray with you. But you've got to make that decision. If you're at our McCulloch campus, members of our prayer team are going to be there as well. But you have to be the one that makes that decision. So have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you asked him to forgive you? And have you become a follower of Jesus? I want to invite you, come forward at the close of our last song, talk to the prayer team, and tell them you're ready to begin following Jesus. Because ready or not, he's coming back. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for hope. God, we thank you that we are only prepared for the return of Jesus because of what Jesus has done. Thank you, Jesus, for saving and loving and shining hope into our hearts. Lord, I want to ask that if there are uh, friends here today that have not yet surrendered their life to you, God, I want to invite you to work in their hearts and draw them to you. Lord, I pray that we would all live with the urgency to tell others about Jesus because the time is near. And thank you for the reminder that we have in that parable that we looked at today. Lord, we commit our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen.